Well, hello again and welcome everybody to the Lyontropy CX Book Club. Um, I'm actually delighted to have a, a new cast of guest reviewers from the world of customer centricity here today. Um, we're going to be meeting up with Alan Pennington and reviewing his book, uh, The Customer Experience Book Club. And right on cue is the man himself. Alan, good afternoon to you. Good afternoon to you Hello too. <laughs> Welcome. Well, Alan, I'm just going to do some introductions. Um, so ra rather than people introduce themselves to me in the audience, I'll, I'll invite them to kind of introduce themselves to you yeah. first of all, and then we'll come back to you to do an introduction and then we'll get going if that's all right. I'm with me. Excellent. Okay. All right. So I'll, I'll work my way through my screen. Top left hand corner is um, is David Wells. So David, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself uh, to Alan, to the audience, and um, uh, then we'll work our way around. That would be great. Thank you, Christopher. And hello, Alan, and uh, everyone watching. Um, my name's David Wells. I've been the founder of customer, um, a company called Shared Aim that I set up about two years ago. My particular focus and interest is on the human experience and the human side of customer experience. And that really comes from a background of my previous career, which was in the fire service, where I led a study of human behavior. And after many years of thinking I know, knew our job and had a professional insight, I sat down and spoke to customers and they completely upended everything I thought I knew and my understanding of what our role was in supporting them. And I've never been able to look back from that and I've just found it fascinating. And so I'm very much interested in the end-to-end -end experience across multiple organizations and the human experience. Um, I still draw on the emergency services background and still work in that space, um, trying to introduce customer experience principles. Um, so I kind of got a foot in both camps and draw from one to the other. But uh, I'm delighted to be with you. Thank you, David, great, excellent. Um, Lauren, can I come to you next, please? Absolutely. Good afternoon, Alan and uh, folks watching. My name is Lauren Fear. I'm actually, it's morning here in San Diego, California. Um, so it's, it's a pleasure to be joining you um, from the West Coast of the United States. Um, I am the founder and president of a company called Loyalty Craft, and we focus on helping companies create meaningful customer experiences. Um, my passion is really helping companies understand and listen better to their customers and find ways to really evolve their customer journey. Um, and so your book was speaking my language. I was loving it and I look forward to today's discussion. Um, I like focusing on healthcare and complex markets that don't always have the best, uh, the best experiences for, for clients. So looking at, at challenges with B2B and then often B2B to C, um, those are a lot of fun to dig into and help companies think about a CX transformation and, and how they can evolve. So looking forward to connecting with everyone and, uh, and learning more today. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, Richard, may I uh, come to you and ask you to introduce your, yourself and uh, show a little bit about your background, please? Yeah, thanks, Chris. And hello, Alan. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so my name is Richard Koch and I'm based in Switzerland, Basel, working for a company called Syngenta, Syngenta Group. It's agrochemistry. Um, industry and uh, I'm responsible for continuous improvement and operational excellence in the company and uh, been with the company for around three and a half years. Uh, previously uh, a bit more than 20 years uh, experience with lean continuous improvement, um, design thinking, creative problem solving uh, and all kinds of things that is about solving problems um, and always been very passionate about how we connect to customers understand how we how we use the needs of the customers and and uh, work our way backwards into the company to, to align to those needs um, using different approaches so and very very fascinating book and really really interested in in learning more about the customer experience uh, thinking brilliant richard thank you so much for that introduction um anna luisa romero may i come to you next please certainly hello everybody and hi alan nice to meet you uh, joining in from brussels uh, with a balmy 23 degrees so it's summer for us <laughs> you can see we have to take the advantage when it comes. Um, Brussels, but as you can see by my name, I am actually not from here, although now I am. 
Um, I've been, uh, st- my career actually started in Silicon Valley. So my love was with tech. I am a biochemist from Stanford University who went into Silicon Valley when um, it was uh, the, head, uh, the heyday of, of technology. And ever since I've been passionate by looking at how technology can actually solve problems for humans. So my role has always been to ask, so who's using it? Um, back then I didn't know that was called uh, user experience, but that was what I always did. I was the translator, the bridge between the techies, the developers, the salespeople, the marketing people, uh, the brand uh, and marketing experts. And I would come in and say, wait a minute, who's doing this and and what are they gonna use with it? Um, Through that experience, I actually had the opportunity to work in organizational development, knowledge management, um, communications as well. And uh, when I had the opportunity to join a customer experience team, I found my home. Customer experience is this beautiful, uh, let me say, it's a combination of so many different areas. It's like a, the whole pie to me. So I, I was gonna say a beautiful pizza pie, but that doesn't sound so beautiful, <laughs> but it is because it has so many different components. You know, you can come at it from so many different areas with the objective of always making sure that that human at the end of the whole to-do is able to do something in a better way in order to do the job that they have to do, but also so that we can improve. Um, So you might think this is very philosophical, but to me, it's all about making things better. So ties back to my science background where I always ask, what is it for and how are we gonna use it? So asking the right questions is where I started in customer experience without knowing it. Uh, And that's why I love the book because it (laughs) gives you a good introduction. Let me say that the first part is kind of philosophical for me. It really brings in a lot of um, opportunities for reflection. I love customer intelligence. That is a concept that I would love to, you know, help uh, build more. And then also picking it up as a guide for anybody, whether it is an experienced uh, uh, practitioner or someone who's new to the field. Voilà. Excellent. Excellent. And uh, Louisa Romero, thank you so much. And, uh, you know, in, in seeking, seeking better outcomes is, uh, you know, certainly the game, isn't it? So brilliant. Thank you all for introducing yourselves. Um, Alan, would you mind just, uh, I mean, obviously you and I have uh, had the opportunity to, to now start to collaborate on, on other things, but I've known you for many years um, through the book. Um, it's, it's something I remember when I first grabbed it thinking, oh, dear, I've just completed a, a customer transformation but for a large utility company and opening the pages with anticipation that I was going to find out I've done it all wrong. But I, I was I was glad to, to realise that I, I felt a fraud then. I felt I must have been listening into your workshops because kind of word for word it chimed. So so you've always been a, a kind of a kindred spirit for me. But um, and I know many people will know you, but would you mind giving yourself, say, you know, the, the platform here and introducing yourselves to our, our guest reviewers and everyone else, please? Uh, yep, certainly. So um, <clears throat> my uh, my background is quite varied. Uh, it goes back uh, uh, too long than I care to remember, but that's by the by. Um, so I started in retail. Why? Because I was always passionate about customers. Uh, so I started in uh, blue chip retail here in the UK. Uh, and uh, I worked for two of the big firms. So uh, Sainsbury's and Safeway, a brand familiar to those in the States as well. Uh, and uh, and I did that because uh, I was I was in front of house. So I was working in the stores, and I loved it, which is great because exactly where I wanted to be. Uh, unfortunately, I was quite good at it. And um, as soon as you're quite good at anything, as we all know, people say, "Oh, let's pluck you out, put you in head office because you're going <laughs> to be fantastic." All right. So so I was taken away from what I loved doing and put into a head office function. Uh, and you kind of the weird thing about that is you feel really current. And then within about six or eight months, you go back into a store somewhere uh, and you start talking to people. Oh, yeah, no, no, we don't do it like that anymore. You're so out of date. You know, I mean, you're in head office now. You're not you're not real. You're not one of the real people. So your currency kind of decays really quickly. Um, and then I went from there uh, via the uh, National Lottery uh, to join uh, the post office. So Royal Mail uh, in the UK. So I went from private sector into public sector. I spent 10 years in the public sector. Uh, my, my, a couple of abiding memories of joining uh, joining a public from private 
was um, I, I, I was on product development because it was all about commercial freedoms and you know, to do more than just send letters because of European stuff, which is great. Uh, so I said, okay, so what's the profitability of this thing that we're now just about to launch? And uh, I, I was looked at and they, they kind of went, what? Well, what's the profitability? No, 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 Alan, don't worry about that. We don't worry about profitability. All we worry about is volume, right? As long as there's a lot of it, that's, that's it. Don't worry about the profit side of things. So I was like, oh, okay, this is interesting. That's a nice idea. Don't have to worry about profit anymore. Uh, and the second thing was I, I made the mistake of sitting in a chair and I was asked to stand up and move from the chair because it wasn't my grade of chair. All right, it had it had a had two arms and a sort of headrest bit, and that was above my pay grade. So I was I was I was asked politely to move uh, into my appropriate seat, which was kind of obviously a little bit lower than everybody else's. Um, so 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 ten years there wasn't that bad. Uh, but I, uh, towards the end of that, I got into um, uh, customer management, which was the call center business of Royal Mail ran about hundred million turnover. So I was commercial director there, and and I was able to let loose on my customer engagement piece again uh, in quite a big way and, and I, I won't talk about it now it's one of my big hobby horses that call centers are a disaster frankly and still remain a disaster people outsource their brand to a third party and then kind of forget about it and then wonder why it all goes wrong that's because you treat it like a commodity but then you go um so uh so um i then took redundancy because uh, royal mail changed its direction was much more about core uh, and said uh, in a crazy decision because uh, my, my wife had taken redundancy. We had three children under two uh, and I thought it'd be a good idea to start up a business from scratch. So um, so I did. Uh, and uh, fortunately, uh, I met a character called David Hicks, uh, who we used to work together. Um, uh, we came together for Mulberry Consulting, Mulberry House as it was, but that was too long. Mulberry House Consulting, far too long for people to type. So we cut it to Mulberry Consulting. Uh, and long story short, um, we were right at the, at the outset of the whole journey mapping piece and, uh, and the whole customer piece. So this was and this was the turn of the century. It's a phrase I love to use. I started the business at the turn of the century. It makes me sound even older than I actually am. Uh, and we ran that for about 14 years and uh, uh, I had the privilege of working all over the world, you know, from, from China to New Zealand to the West Coast to, uh, to uh, the Middle East, you name it, we worked in it. Um, and we were very much the forefront of, of a lot of thinking at the time, and, and we had a, a fantastic reputation. Um, as soon as you get that, of course, you know, 14 years in, somebody wants to buy it, so they did. Uh, uh, I was intended to be quite a big wheel in that new organisation, but within a matter of weeks, funnily enough, they'd let me go. Um, <laughs> but that's, that's one for over a pint down the pub conversation about how that happened. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's a human capital business. Uh, there's the kind of business that we're, that we're in consulting wise or whatever in those days. Um, so I then had to take a year off. Uh, oh dear, I can hear you all saying how sad for you. So they paid me to not work. Um, at that point, Pearson came in and said, oh, this area is really hot. Uh, so this was sold the business uh, end, end of 2014, beginning of 2015. Um, this is a timeline for you. And then Pearson came in fairly early on and said, hmm, this is really hot. Would you like to write the book on this stuff? And foolishly, I said, well, yeah, there's only so many kind of jobs around the house I could do. I've got a year of doing nothing. What? Why not? Uh, and there began an odyssey, which we we're going to talk about, um, of actually writing a book about something you think you know quite a lot about. Um, and since then, that's published. And, and I still I love the fact it's still selling. I get lovely tweets and kind of messages and LinkedIn connections, people all over the world still who are using it in a way I wanted them to use it, which is great. Um, and, uh, and now I spend my time um, just doing advisory work for uh, people I know, uh, typically senior in organisations, who genuinely want to make a difference and genuinely want to execute on customer or employee experience stuff. Uh, and I'm doing that at the moment for one of the big four consulting, which is, which is fantastic because I, I get to deliver the stuff that is actually in the book and kind of bring those messages out. That's me. Excellent. Yeah, excellent. Well, th thank you. And that's really good to, to get the, the plotted history. And um, I look forward to that point and finding out just why they did. I mean, they, they in fairness, for the rest of us, it was an advantage because there was no more Mulberry to worry about. So, you know. It was... <laughs> yeah, that's, that's really true. Yeah. That's, uh, anyway, um, so, I mean, you, 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 you partly asked, answered it because, you know, we also, this is the first question, but um, 
uh, I want to get to you first of all, and then we'll come round and ask everybody to kind of give their, their views on the book, because everyone's very kindly written a re review, um, what they get from it. But you've partly answered it with the Pearson approach, but you did you did give coming some inclination there about how people are wanting are using it how you wanted them to. So, you know, what was what was the motivation? I mean, to, to actually put something down, which, you know, better than most, it's an evolving sector. So therefore, you know, there was always the, the danger that it could be, you know, yesterday's news before it actually became published. But fortunately, I mean, it certainly isn't. I think you've kind of you know, got the backbone absolutely spot on. But uh, so what was the motivation behind it then? Yeah, I, I wanted to avoid the sense that it, that it would become um, tomorrow's fish wrapping paper. And uh, that's which is always a great fate for news these days. Uh, although less so because there's, there's health and safety people, so you can't eat it off the newspaper. <laughs> <or somewhere. laughs> uh, so I bring it home and then decant it into a newspaper just so it feels like the old days. Um, so, um, so yes, partly okay, uh, somebody approaches you and says, well, we're, we're going to pay you if you write this book, then yeah, that's a motivation. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll give them that. But the that, that's not enough to want to sit down and write a book because it's, uh, it's a quite a painful experience if you try and do it or if you've already done it, you'll know. Um, so for me, it was about, uh, it, this was a time, it's only four or five years ago, but it was the start of what I would call a mini explosion of people being given customer experience titles. So more and more firms were becoming aware of the experience being important, more and more of them are realizing that well, maybe this should be quite strategic about uh, how we run our business. And this could be a big differentiator. So they went about it in many cases because the organization didn't exist. There's no slot the, them into this role. We have to create this role inside the organization, which is a problem in itself still today. Nobody quite knows where it fits or who it should report to and all that sort of stuff. I've got my own views on that. Um, and so um, I had people come to me independently and say, look, I've got, I've got this great new job. I'm the director of customer experience for Blah Blah Company, and I, I, I don't know where to start. So I was like, oh, okay, well, you could try doing this sort of thing. And then at the other end of the spectrum, I was, I was talking to, to you know, CEOs and board members who were saying, you know, we really want to do this stuff, but we're not quite sure how to get going. So um, in both cases, I think the C word was what was missing, which was confidence right? and capability. So you put those two together and you've got a big hole. So if I arrive day one and I'm looking to my boss usually to tell me what to do or, you know, here's the direction and your boss is looking at you blankly saying, well, you've got the job. Off you go. And there were quite often people who maybe come from a service background. So they might have been a head of service and amazing at doing customer service. But the leap from there to experience is way be bigger than people actually realize. So I wanted it to be a book that worked on two levels. I wanted it to be a book that CEOs or senior execs who felt they should and intuitively knew it should be something they're doing to give them an insight into how they can play their part and get the thing moving. But far more importantly, I wanted it to be a book that had um, lots of little dog-eared bits and bits of paper hanging up. My copy's got bits of paper. This is an old boarding pass that I use as a bookmark, right? And I wanted it to be up on the shelf, exactly like that, exactly like that, right? Right, so well-thumbed, well-worn, and you just kind of know it's there when I need it because it should be there at that moment in time, and, and it's very difficult to do that. So. It's something you want to do a journey map. You haven't done one for six months, nine months. And you're like, God, how did I do it again? Right, quick, I'll grab that off the shelf. I've, I've got it. So that's what I wanted it to be. So, and I also wanted it to be something that anybody who is in a startup position in the role could follow the logic of saying, build some really solid foundations, do these things, and you will set yourself up as best you possibly can for success. There's no guarantees. Uh, but hey, that's the way life goes. Uh, but if it can help you to get the foundations right and give you some of those answers, then to me, I've been successful. So, so that was the aim. Brilliant, great. Thank, thank you very much for that. So, so let's let's go around then, and I, and I get our guest reviewers to to give their reflection first of all on on Alan's book. And it's an open forum, and he's not in the room, so he can't kind of swipe back at you. So you know, um, I'm sure it won't go in that direction. But well, you know, my virtual be, board rubber here, to throw people. <laughs> be be honest with him. I mean, you know, the feedback may 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 force Pearson into customer experience book too who knows but uh richard can i come to you first of all what, what was your reflection on on alan's book please 
So a lot of things actually. So I think um, starting with the feeling that I have when I read the book, I think it's what I really like is feels very personal and it feels also very authentic. So you immediately feel you have a connection to to Alan, the writer, uh, and there is a um, dialogue going on. You're talking to the reader very personally. I, I really enjoy that. And it's, it's plain language uh, very much. It's not trying to use uh, difficult, complex ways of describing things. It's very easy to get into what you want to say. Um, so I, I really enjoy that kind of a personal, direct interaction and connection to the reader. Um, I also think um, it is a book which is kind of almost like a, a pot which is boiling. It's a lot of things happening at the same time. So there is, and like you said, you can really feel that you have these different intentions going on in parallel. On one hand, being practical, uh, um, bubbling with uh, a lot of small uh, examples, uh, tools, methods, approaches, what very practical, what you can use. And at the same time, in the background, it's always trying to put in uh, a broader context, a bit more philosophical, and sometimes going off track a bit to, to do a, a, a U-turn somewhere, and then you come back again. Uh, that is, um, for me, maybe in the beginning of the book, it was felt sometimes a bit um, um, unstructured but at the same time very engaging so it's engaging it's inspiring it's a lot of you get a lot of ideas but it's not a complete structure where you have um, the complete framework and you you go through and here is a methodology so to say it's more free a free form i would say but it's a nice way a nice nice way of of, of inviting the reader to to discover, uncover a lot of new things, both in terms of, I think, uh, basic elements, but also taking off on a route where it's not any more basic stuff, but actually starting to try to discover new areas. Uh, so it, it's very nice, nice way of, of, of a book being a mix of things and, and very, very inspirational, I would say. Brilliant. Thank, thank you. Uh, yeah. I, I love the expression "discover and uncover." I think mm. it kind of really, have really, really mm. resonated with me. Um, quite an interesting one, actually, because uh, when, when you start to write a book and, and you get a professional editor, they ask you to to, to, to create your own style of writing, and, um, and 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 I had a couple of goes at before I actually got to what I felt comfortable with, which I'm which I'm delighted that uh, that Richard uh, got that sense because. It was, it was always intended to be written in a conversational way and a, and a kind of approachable way rather than a textbook. So you, so I didn't let my wife read any of it, not that she's particularly interested in it anyway, until I finished it. Uh, uh, but then she started to read some of it and she said, this is really spooky because like I can hear you saying this <laughs> and, and you're sat in the room next to me. It's really quite spooky. So, so I'm delighted that you got that sense because it's so important to me that it, it felt uh, approachable as opposed to dogmatic here it is d d d d d d because none of us have got all the answers and I, I got the sense sometimes that I was all, I could almost see you in a workshop just setting up with your with a colleague just saying oh another thing another thing you know it's, it's that kind of those prompts as you went through so it's, so Lauren let's come to you and, and, and get your your review of the uh, the book then please mm, thank you yeah you know when when Anna was introducing herself and said you know, when I kind of finally got into the CX room, I felt like I found my tribe, I found my people. The The book did that for me as well. It was like, oh yeah, I'm talking to a colleague here who's got some really great advice. And, and I, <laughs> I kind of laughed when, yeah, absolutely. It was like, remember this. <laughs> um, and, and it's, you know, I smile throughout throughout the book, being reminded of, of some things that are just so important in this work. Um, you know, the relevance is still here. This is certainly not old fish paper. Um, and for me, the relevance in terms of the conversation where CX is maturing is things like thinking about the employee experience um, prior to the customer experience. And I really love the section on that and that focus of thinking about the fact that, you know, without 
and employees delivering that experience and thinking about what they're going through in the journey, um, you know, you're, you're never going to be able to deliver the customer experience. So that was something I truly appreciated. I loved, and I was searching for it in here to, to be able to quote you, because I think that's the best form of flattery when I'm literally reading <laughs> from you. But, um, you know, you mentioned how, you know, the customer experience seems like hundreds of things, but then it's, it's thousands of things. It's all in the detail. Um, and I think at times that can be pretty overwhelming for, you know, for that CEO who's like, just show me what to do and give me a magic wand. And you're like, oh, no, 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 this is, there's no magic wand here. It's all in the detail and it's all in the, you know, the, the many tips in this book. So um, I appreciated that, you know, that thought of, of how do you get to those details, but and, and practically implement well, um, but then also raise it up to the strategic level. Um, so you can get that buy-in from, you know, from those executives in the big chairs. So I certainly appreciated um, the, the tying of the two, the marrying of the two. Excellent. Lauren, thank you very yeah. much. So Sorry, quick, Anna. Just quickly, the employee bit. If I was rewriting the book, I'd do more on that um, because I'm, I'm spending almost all my time at the moment working on exactly that, which is great joy because it's like 20 years behind the customer experience stuff. But a lot of the same principles apply. Um, so, yeah, the, the employee bit. Thank you. Um, Anna Luisa, can I ask you to give your reflection on, on I know you've, you've, you've given some already, but any, any more you'd like to add to that? <laughs> um, that I loved it, that uh, <laughs> I quite enjoyed it. Um, I think you can say that part one was my favorite because it opens up, like I said, the opportunity for people who do not know about customer experience, just to invites them you know, to discover and uncover, as Richard said. It's, I, I love that we can actually hear each other in the reflections. Um, for me, it also, different levels, CEO, as well as a, a manager in customer experience or a director that has now been given the strategic role of rolling out a customer experience program. It opens up opportunities for us to think more about the discipline, about the concepts that are not set in stone because there's an evolution, there's always, hopefully, we need to keep that evolving, but also it gives you the time to reflect. Um, and, and I loved part one because I, ha I actually spent quite a bit of time on it. Going back to it, I, uh, I have so many notes and highlights because I want to come back and explore more or read more about this or that. Um, so the part one to me was sort of philosophical. Um, exploration and deepening into certain concepts like linking CX to ROI or mm. where does CX have to live? That's one of the biggest questions in terms mm. of organizational structure. And tied to that, how can we train ourselves better so that we can be the best practitioner? Can we stay generalists? Like I would like to be the, the pizza, the, all the slices of the pizza of the pie, or do you want to specialize voice of the customer or data analysis? Uh, mm -mm employee experience, which is more towards HR. Don't know, but all of this is what I think your book will always serve as. Remember this, remember that. And I also <laughs> love that practical, you know, to me it was like, oh, remember this. Oh yes, remember that, right. What about this? The second part also that it brings you in a journey of, okay, if you need to set up a customer experience program, what are the steps that you need to follow? Perhaps not sequentially, but think about this and think about this and think about this. Um, and I'm totally with you that in terms of ex employee experience, we are seeing that more and more, there is no customer experience without employee experience. And I see it always as a little triangle, virtuous triangle. You know, there's a uh, happy customers. Yeah, well, happy employees. Happy employees make happy customers. And guess what? If the two of those are happy, then it's happy business as well. So it's <laughs> like, it has to be always balanced. Here comes my geeky, it's, I, you know, it's like, I always see things in balance. Uh, in quadrants and, and keeping the equilibrium be between the three. Customer experience is not fluffy. Customer experience is strategical. And you said it, not in those words, but it, you keep reminding us, there's this you have to remember. And then there's this you have to remember. And yeah, business, you gotta pay attention to it. Um, yeah. Measurements, yeah. metrics. So, Wonderful. Thank you. If, if, I, if, I, if I may, um, if I can come to you, David, if you want to give your review, and then if you wouldn't mind launching into your first question as well, David, to kind of end that, and then um, be ready, Alan. Yeah, these, okay. come, these come thick and fast, and uh, okay. nothing's going to be held back. So over to you, David. 
Okay, thank you, Kristen. Uh, I wasn't quite sure because it's been a long time since I've been given a book to read that I haven't chosen. So I was a little bit uh, uncertain <laughs> what to expect. But I've got to say, having met you briefly, I think you've achieved something fantastic that it perfectly matches the you that I'm meeting, the words that come off the page and the style of the time. Um, Good. I really enjoyed it. And it's one that I will go back to. I've, I've scanned through it quickly. I read it more depth. It's also one I go back to and I've got a huge great reading list. So that's not something I say lightly. And I think what you've, you've captured is a fantastic balance of descriptive, but not prescriptive. You've left room for people to think. You've used it as a roadmap. I can follow along the way, but you haven't told me just follow this. And I, I love the fact that so the bits I want to go back and I think Anna mentioned it is there's lots of little bits to catch up on, um, little debates that sit within that. that and I think most of those you actually take from intangible to give some sense of why it matters to a business and not just left hanging as philosophical debates. You relate it back to hard business practice. But equally, many of those, we've got many more discussions to have. We've got lots more work to do to really bring it to the forefront. Mm. Um, so I, I thought it's a genuinely a fantastic mix of a book. And I think it's real value for me would be that I could give it to somebody from outside of customer experience, a senior manager, and we've got a shared language. There is enough in there that somebody new to the sector could pick up and talk about. And I could also follow through there as well. So I think it, it, I would see it used very much in that way. And I think the bit that I, I really love, and again, sort of quoting words back to you, understanding the, the place in the customer's lives. It, it's something I've spent a long time thinking about from the research that I've done, because I, I think obviously there's a, a lot of marketing oriented professionals come into customer experience. And I think we all had a different perspective. Um, I can't inhabit that world, but I think what I learned was actually, you have to see the lens, we're human first. Whatever it is you're selling me, whatever you're trying to help me with, that's part of what's happening to me day to day. And that scenario around me changes every day and it affects my drivers and, and everything else. And so I think for me, the more I thought about it, it the more it is exactly as you've, you've, you've sort of stated there, how does that fit into a person's lives? Not how do I drag them into mine as a, a brand organization? Because I think they're fundamentally different. And I, I suspect it's partly because, and again, you touch it in the book, Business is like certainty. So we lose a lot of quant, a lot of data, big data, presumably meant to capture more quant certainty. We hate risk, we hate uncertainty and complexity. And so you're constantly trying to simplify and, and bring that knowledge. Our lives aren't like that, you know, day to day. And in this last year, certainly we've seen that. And so I, I think, as I say, I, I love the essence of that. And there's so much I want to go back to in the book because there are th phrases you throw in there that actually almost are in the book themselves. And back to Christopher's point, if Pearsons are looking, there's probably a series, not a sequel. <laughs> yeah. Um, so just on the question, I, I, you make the point about not whether we need to learn from the past and, and not making the same mistakes in there. I think on one hand, it's great news that we're seeing this acceleration around digital adoption um, and the transformations and with the caveats you make. But actually, as you say, if we learn from the past, they haven't had a high success rate. Um, the, the figure of 70% failure or not realizing the full benefits is often thrown around. So to an extent, I think it's a great opportunity for us in that customer experience has come to the forefront and now we're seeing investment. Are we not potentially creating the next CRM where we launch behind that and we're not actually going to learn the lessons from the past. We're just going to do it a lot quicker. So I'm really interested in your views of what you've seen about what are the safeguards and how do we as a customer experience industry make sure that in this excitement to see this adoption, we're not all standing there looking at each other in two or three years saying, oh, that happened. Yeah, well, that's a massive question. <laughs> uh, and I, I, I'll try and answer it in a, in a very limited way because, um, Yes, that is, that is a risk, you know, I, and I, I think I made the point in the book that CRM uh, being the saviour of everything 20 years ago, and uh, it was all about uh, how, how you can buy a Siebel system and that will solve everything if it ever went wrong in your life, uh, including your marriage and everything else, it doesn't matter, it will sort it out, right? And of course, it was a complete myth. And, uh, and the challenge now is, um, how do you uh, capture the enthusiasm for 
uh, customer experience and hopefully employee experience in a senior management team and translate that into something that's actually deliverable. And there's, there's, there's a couple of risks to that. So at one level, this is seen as a huge opportunity by certain large consulting firms uh, and uh, big data firms and others to simply uh, sell their products off the back of a thin veneer of customer experience. Uh, but you know, if you scratch the reserves and pretty quickly you realize they're just selling more stuff to you. Um, but I think the difference today is hopefully there is a there is a growing group of professionals out there now, ones in this room and beyond, who are who are more in a position than they were before to positively influence the outcome. Right. So it's it's less of kind of fumbling around in the dark. Hopefully, that's one of the reasons for writing the book in the first place, is that when management come calling and say, hey, look, we, we need a new CX uh, director or head of or EVP. If they chose the, choose the right, the person has now has access to a lot of other things that will help. Right? So European Customer Experience Organization has just been set up. CXCXP has been running for quite a long time now. So there's a lot more assets out there to help people if they're willing to take up the opportunity to grab hold of here you are, here's the budget, go do something, and they will do it, okay? I don't blame necessarily senior management for CRM because they were just taken along on a wave of enthusiasm and sold the story that it would it would change everything and bought a few people 18 months time before they got fired as the FD. In this case, I think where that money is, is made available, there's now a much better opportunity for people to take it and do something really practical with it. And for me, it, it's about doing practical things with it. It's not setting up some huge transformation program. It's not trying to say it's going to solve the world peace problem. If we do, if we all become customer centric, in fact, I don't want people to be customer centric, frankly, uh, in, a, in a strategic sense, because it just doesn't work in my view, how controversial is that? Um, so so if, if we can use it to enable people and support, I mean, this community is growing now and it's growing in its maturity and there are some fantastic people out there, Christopher's one of them, who, who, who can help and support you during that, that approach and make sure that you are as successful as you can be. I don't think that was there in the past. I don't think the empirical evidence was there in the past to say, okay, uh, show me how this is gonna make me some money. Well, now there's a vast array of information out there that will show you there is ROI on this stuff, very definitely, and ROI both in the quant and the qual sense. So I think, if we as a community, we're sensible about how we approach it and we support each other during that and we adopt some of the simple, simple, keep it simple uh, approaches and deliver some benefits. Oh, yeah, look, 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 it added some value. Then you will build that confidence in the more senior network to continue and not to do the, oh, we've got a short term sales problem. What can we cut? Oh yeah, let's cut anything to do with experience because that's just kind of fluffy, lovely, cotton woolly stuff. But we can park it, right? Yeah. So that's the challenge. Though. Great, thank you very much, Alan. Um, Richard, can I come to you next for your question, please? Sorry, <laughs> was on mute. Yes, of course. Um, so my question is one thing that I really enjoyed in the book, and it was mentioned before in the reviews, it was. Uh, you're coming back to these small data, the small things, the uniqueness, um, not getting lost in the big data. Uh, and um, also you talk about um, uh, all the small things that matters. Uh, but one question I have is, is around, uh, you introduce different tools. One tool that you mentioned a couple of times, but I don't feel that you really introduce is personas. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I was reflecting, is there a specific reason for that? Is that connected to that you have a stronger belief in the unique uh, individual customer and you don't want to go on averages, so to say, and that's why you kind of scheme over the personas or, is, or do you have any other thoughts on what, what, what's your relationship to the tool and the approach on, on personal sure. well um I, I begin with the premise that um I, if i'd had a dollar for the number of times that a client has said to me we've got 900 different personas in our in our customer base 
I'd be a very wealthy individual now. <laughs> and, and could, I, could I actually have a different journey map for each of them? Because they're all unique. <laughs> right? Then I'd be even richer. Right? And, uh, and actually, the reality is you don't. Uh, and, and in all my experience, there are very few experiences that different segments, and I hate the term segment because that's some kind of tropical freak, but research people like to use it, uh, groups, let's call it, groups of customers who you believe are unique and you believe you give a unique service to. And I would argue that not even for race, 95% of what they get is the same. And so it should be, frankly, otherwise you'd be crazy, right? Now, so, so I begin with the premise that actually you, you create the vanilla version first that, that the majority of your customers will experience, right? And then you take, if you've got specifics, you take personas and you then tweak and adjust the, the baseline that you've got. So if I give you an example, so an airline first class customer, uh, what do they do? Well, do you know what? They arrive at the airport, they have to park their car or they're dropped off by a taxi or a chauffeur, doesn't matter, taxi, chauffeur, same thing. They then have to check in, they have to go through security, they have to get on board the plane, they have to sit down, they have to follow the safety announcement, all the rest of it, right? All of those steps from a journey map point of view are pretty much the same as me in economy. Right, so then you say, well, where are the differences? Well, okay, uh, a check-in, they've got a different check-in desk. Okay, so we can pull that out and we can look at that specifically and say, what, what do we need to do for this persona? In this case, first-class passenger. So you're using it, but you're using it in a very specific circumstance. And you're using it as the exception, as opposed to saying you've got 10 personas and you're trying to juggle all 10 personas and trying to create stuff for all 10 personas, right? And if you've then got a business class passenger versus a first class passenger, different group, but you're taking 80% of the same experience for your first class passenger, and you're just downgrading it a little bit, all right? That's an easy way of managing stuff. And if you begin the other way around and you say, we've got all these different customer groups, oh my God, where do I begin? I mean, that's, that's, that's the reality. So I, I, I don't spend too much time on personas, you're right, and I could have spent more on it. Um, and for me, a persona, to be clear, is much more about, I want a persona template to provide me with a template of how people feel and the emotional side of that, as opposed to like, a quick bit of description, you know, they're this wealthy or whatever, but I want to know how that person feels differently to my normal audience. And therefore, to respond to that, it's much more about the emotional side of it than so it's creating a visual picture of who this person is, what they dress like, and what hairdresser do they go to. So for me, that's the kind of background picture that you're then setting in context with um, the overall experience. But any business that wants to bespoke its experiences to 10, 20 different personas is crazy, frankly. I mean, you just go out of business, in my view. Thank you. Brilliant, Alan. Thank, thank you thanks. so much. For that. Really good insight. Really appreciate that. Um, can I come to uh, Anna Louisa? Would you mind sharing your question with, with Alan? Yeah, actually, I have been, I of course sent one question, which was more about talking about ROI and how do we insert ourselves into the annual plan planning process? Because, yeah, we know as you said, that the first thing that comes to mind is, oh, what are we going to cut this year? Boom, um, there goes customer experience. Um, have you had any situations where you actually managed to insert the customer experience line into the planning process, the business plan? Uh, the, the answer is yes, but only once, which tells you something out of my entire career in the, because you know, you're talking holy grail here, because as soon as you're in the annual plan and you've got a line in that, a bit like being on the organizational chart, with a very sensible kind of reporting line, right? So it's the holy grail to get into that. And the fact it's not there means that CX or EX professionals spend their life with a begging bowl saying, you know, I need some money to do this, or can we invest in that? Or can I squint a little bit of your tech budget here to do this, or your little bit of your research budget to do this? So I, I think that, that frankly, uh, Anna, is, is, a, is, a, is a long-term goal for most people and you kind of have to accept the reality that that's going to be the case i think um yeah the one occasion where, it, where it's happened uh it has been on the employee side 
and it's been um, it's been put in because uh, the individual responsible, so the EVP responsible for that area, uh, really saw the business benefit from some work that had been done over the previous eighteen months and wanted to solidify that moving forward. So instead of working on a hand to mouth basis, uh, she wanted to embed it into at least 18 months. And rather than run it as a project, which could be cut, uh, she put it into her own uh, business plan and argued the case with her colleagues that this was a, it was a very solid reason for doing so. Now, I, I think the light on the horizon is that there are more and more enlightened people this is to say that the current incumbents in senior roles are so dyed in the wool Luddites that they don't want to get involved with uh, CX and EX, but unfortunately that's often the case, largely because they don't really understand it. I think there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a, a group of people coming through now who are uh, younger, who are more exposed to this and have been in the past, some of them are in this room probably, who would very happily stand up and uh, say, this needs to be in my plan and here's why, and we'll be able to justify it with some sensible numbers behind it, right? That are not questionable. And you're able to demonstrate value from putting that in. So for me, I'm, I'm hopeful that you, the future, uh, will make that happen because where I sit today, it's still bloody difficult to get uh, anybody to sign up to something beyond a you know a one-off budget sadly but that's reality I really, really good point really good point um rich richard had to disappear at another meeting so i'm just thinking before i lose any more of you um would you mind holding your book up so we can get just a, a picture of everyone with their um their bible in front of them oh there we go I've got mine. there we go have you got a signed copy there adam were you lucky enough uh yeah so i guess some guy wrote it i so didn't <laughs> it for me yeah Interesting. I mean, that that last point is just such an interesting one to hear. You sort of, you know, of all the places you've travelled and all the organisations you've worked with, that still is a kind of a, a holy grail as opposed to a um, a lockdown piece. Um, uh, so uh, that brings us now to um, one one more question. We've got one more question to go here. If I missed anyone's question. Lauren, I thought it was you. Yes, Lauren, would, sorry about that. Please, could you share okay. your question? I really liked um, the seventh chapter where you talk about design and you know thinking about how we're designing journeys that, um, that are really meaningful and, and the thousands of things we can be thinking about. Um, you know, when we're recruiting participants in the design process across an organization, um, you know, something that, that always has me thinking is how do I make sure I've got uh, you know, I, I've got folks who are interacting with customers regularly and really at the front line, and also folks who think differently and aren't going to just say, well, this is the way we've always done it, but really bring innovation to the table. And, and I, I always ask to, to do that. I think the piece that I, I always want to, and especially after this year, um, you know, it's so important to think about diversity of thought and inclusion. And I'm curious of your perspective on how do you do that maybe in different ways so we don't end up with, you know, I always think of the, the famous example of the racist soap dispenser that, you know, was di designed with, you know, a room full of people who miss the fact that hands aren't all white, right? Yeah. Um, so, yeah. so just love to hear your comments around uh, diversity and inclusion in design. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's something close to my heart, I have to say, Lauren, and, uh, and it's certainly where over the last few years, I've been much more focused on the design side of things um, because for me, uh, just creating journey maps you can do that pretty quickly, frankly, and there are so many people choosing it. So for me, you know, the future, which is what people really want to get into, is how do I redesign stuff, right? And the great thing about organisations is they've got lots of people, and the bad thing about organisations is that they only choose to listen to one or two of them, right? And a design is an experience designer, whether that's employee or customer, doesn't matter. Um, you can engage anybody and everybody in the organization. And often the people who uh, feel they are least able to contribute are the ones who contribute the most. So um, quite often, and we're running design stuff, I'll make sure we've got people from finance, from uh, IT, uh, from the front line, so you literally can invite them, regardless of grade or job function, you forget all of that stuff because at the end of the day, 
all you've got, and including this inclusion, inclusion as well, because the huge opportunity to bring people in with different backgrounds, different thought processes. And my view on it is you forget about the fact that they're employed by the firm. You just bring them together as diverse and kind of uh, odd group of people as you could in a room. And if you facilitate it well, not only you will be amazed, they will be amazed by what they come out with, right? And the number of times I've had people you know, during a coffee break come and say, oh, blimey, I'm really, I didn't think it was going to be, I thought it was going to be the most boring day ever. And actually, I'm really enjoying it and I'm, I'm having fun. And actually, I've realised I can contribute to this stuff. And actually, my, oh, that's that idea you came up with. It was brilliant, right? And people come up with all kinds of incredible ideas in, in those kind of sessions. So for me, it's, a, it's, a, it's an excuse almost in the organisation to kind of go, no, we, we don't want the usual suspects in the room for this. And I, I, or the, or the go-tos. I want to get, I'm just going to randomly kind of pick a bunch of people and, and get them into the room and let's see where it goes, right? And they come up with incredible thinking and you kind of go, bloody hell. I remember one, one that was just stuck out in my mind was in South Africa and we got a group of people there and we had to kind of be like, oh, really, why am I here? I can't do this stuff. I'm not a creative thinker. I'm a plodder doing finance. Uh, and this person for finance came out with this amazing idea, which was we talk about servicing cars. Right? And she said, well, um, I want to I want to I want maximum use of my asset here. So she's using her. So why I, 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 I don't want my car service when uh, when I need it. I want to. So why don't we do it at night? And everyone went. Bloody hell, yeah, that's genius. <laughs> so you're sweating the asset, so you're answering all the kind of quantitative questions that the finance people would ask you. You're providing a service at when, which nobody else is providing, when the customer wants it, and you can also keep you know, everything moving. You've got less traffic on the road. Imagine doing that in San Diego, right, in the middle of the day versus at one o'clock in the morning. I mean, the traffic's not great at one o'clock in the morning, I know, but... It's a hell of a lot better than it is at midday, right? So, so you start to think about this stuff and you go, yeah, right. Now, now that came out of a finance person's mouth. He would never have said they should ever be in the room and everybody loved it, right? Brilliant. So take the opportunity to take off any badges, labels, anything else, just randomly pick some people, put them in a the room and say, you're going to help me design this stuff. Excellent. Thank you. And we've got a we've got a question from our uh, one of our attendees, which will, will will allow us to kind of wrap up here. From Jonathan Carter, who sends his regards, um, and uh, he, he asks, um, uh, he thinks uh, CX should. Do you think CX should approach? Sorry, start again. How he thinks CX should approach playing a deeper and more strategic role in brand manifestation across all brand touch points. How long have we got? But good question, Jonathan, ever. <laughs> it's a nice short one. <laughs> Look, for me, um, yes, it has a strategic role. Absolutely has a strategic role. Um, what I tend to do at the moment is I downplay that a little bit because people get scared when you talk about strategic. It's like, oh, hold on a minute. Oh, well, well, we've got that covered. All right. So I, I prefer the guerrilla terrorist tactic of kind of uh, subversive activity. So you touch as many of the uh, brand touch points as you can, and you actually subvert it through the teams that own those touch points, and you get them on board without calling it strategy. So let's go talk to the people who do uh, I don't know, the onboarding of a new customer or the people who do the finance management or the credit control or the, wherever else it is. And we get lots of little things happening in those areas and people kind of going, oh, actually, yeah, this is easier than I thought it would be. Is this really customer stuff? Yeah, it is. That's excellent, good. So it absolutely should have this manifestation across not every touch point, because not every touch point, frankly, is important to customers or employees. But if you can find the right ones across that journey, then yes, it should be. But don't try and do it top down uh, unless you're in a very enlightened organisation. It's better to do it bottom up and then show them the results and then have them say, oh, yeah, we, we need to do that stuff. Okay, good. We're we're on board. So, that's a very short question to short, short answer to a rather tricky question. Thanks, John. <laughs> Thanks, um, and uh, if I might just pose one very quick question at the end. What what I found as I was reading the book was I was almost 
and you were the role model for customer customer experience or customer centricity. And as you went through it, you were kind of putting on your cloak and putting it, getting all your gear and ready to go. And and you, that's because you've been through it so many times. But actually, how, how do how do those trying to get the senior leaders to get um, engagement in the business? behave as a role model when that role model has to look so different to everyone else in the organization how do they stop looking like someone who stands out and start looking like the heartbeat of the business what are the tricks to kind of you know help you be one step ahead uh okay so um it's very easy to get shot down in a cx role all right you, you put one foot out of line you, you annoy the wrong key stakeholder and you know you're almost dead in the water without thinking about it so I shouldn't be having to say this, but I do uh, need to say it, which is you, you need to um, choose your battles wisely when it comes to engaging. Um, you need to know you're going to be successful. Accept the fact that actually, do you know what? Uh, there's going to be a load of naysayers in the organisation. And, uh, and it's much harder to bang your head against a brick wall, to use another metaphor, than it is to, uh, to push on an open one. So for me, uh, you will find in every organization, people who get it and people who are very supportive of it and people who genuinely want to do it and seeking out those people to create, because you know, if you're an individual or a, let's say a big team, three maybe in an organization that's looking at CX or EX, right? You cannot do it on your own. You have to have people around you, behind you, people who will support you. And so you need to create, we used to call them, I'm going to remember this, beacons in the Mulberry Day. There are beacons, there are people who are, they just get this stuff and they really want to help. And if you can surround yourself with those people, it does two things. One, they become catalysts to their bit of the organisation. So you, you can't do everything. If you can catalyse them and get them going, give them some things to do, help out, they'll do it. That frees up time for you to think about other things that you're going to do. So have those people, support those people, effectively, uh, kind of back to my subversive bit, you know, they are, they're, they're the moles in the organisation, the underground, uh, who will help you out and they will do stuff. And those little things that they do really help you as, a, as an individual. So choose your battles uh, wisely. And don't try and force this down people's throats and say it's the new saviour and because people will, the body politic will react against you and kind of reject you really quickly over there. So great. Yeah. And, and maybe not even, they won't even say, do you know what? I don't like you, Lauren. They'll just simply say, oh, I'm not available. I've got a slot in about six months time, actually. Yeah. Yeah. I think I could fit you in then. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Or, uh, oh, I had an hour, but I've only got 25 minutes now. Is that okay? All right. So all of those passive aggressive behaviors will come out. And, and you've got to recognise the reality of this situation. Don't live in a dream world that it's just going to be easy. So you've just, you've just got to think about it quite hard, which is what I now spend quite a lot of my time doing, just coaching and advising mm -hmm. people who are in the role on how to make it happen. Because sometimes you just need a sane voice that you can talk to who kind of like, gets you. <laughs> it's a very lonely place otherwise, leading in CX, as I said. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, thank you, Anna. It's a, it's a, after all these years, it can still be a lonely place. You're right. Well, it, but it's good to have everybody needs this as a companion, to kind of you know, yeah. come back to. So this is this. I mean, this for me is you know, it's it's always been, and I think for anyone who reads it, it becomes kind of your go-to. It's one of those kind of go-to. There's some good authors on who do sp speak specifically about topics. But if you need an all-rounder, you know, I think I think you you you'll struggle to find words better than that. So thank you, Alan, for taking the time. Uh, and having a year to, to put that together for us we're eternally grateful um we're on the hour so we're going to wrap now so i'd like to thank um each of my guest uh, reviewers david lauren uh, anna louisa and uh richard thank you very much for, for joining us we had a, an audience there um who uh um i think probably have all uh come across you before alan but we'll be very grateful to, to hearing you uh, speak again as have i it's, it's always good to hear you speak so and thank you alan for agreeing to join us on this lime triple cx book club review um if people want your book it's on amazon um it's, it's there There's, there never seems to be enough copies so uh, you know be, be careful don't leave it till the last minute if you need it before you're about to start a program get in there early um but i'll let you just have the last last say if i can alan 
Uh, well, yeah, it's, it's been a pleasure. Thank you to all the reviewers for, for taking the time to, to read the book. I mean, and there's nothing I love more than hearing how people are using it, what they're doing with it, what could be better. Um, I, I have been asked if I write a book now about the ROI of this stuff, and I'm kind of going, oh, I don't know about that. We'll see. I think there may be better things, employee being one of them. Uh, but it's, it's been a real pleasure and, and, and nothing I love more. And thank you, Christopher and Brian Trophy for organising it because um, <laughs> it's great to, to meet and see some proper warm professionals out there. Thanks Good so. luck. Th thank you, Alan. And, and keep keep making sure that, you know, your content and your narrative is heard. It's, it's a noisy old place out there, but, uh, you know, the, the quality needs to pierce through. It really does. Thank you, everyone. We're going to sign off there. Take care. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Goodbye.